Hi there. My name is Renee Hobbs, and uh, welcome to tonight. Media um, tonight we are um, focusing on the topic of first-year teachers. Uh, those of us who've been in the classroom for a long time remember, uh, vaguely remember, uh, the traumatizing and exhilarating ride that the first year ultimately uh, is. Um, but we are really excited to be able to some first year teachers. Uh, so joining me tonight is uh, David Cooper Moore, uh, Rachel McClure, Stephanie Viens, and Elizaveta Frasum. And um, I'd like to ask each of you to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about the context and situation where you work as a first year teacher. David, how about we start with you? Sure. Um, my name is David Cooper Moore, and I am a media instructor at Yes Philly, which is a uh, Philadelphia accelerated high school. Um, an accelerated high school is one that is designed for students who have dropped out of or um, couldn't attend a public high school and can get their degree in two years instead of four. So I do the media stuff there. Cool. Thanks so much. Stephanie, how about if you introduce yourself to the uh, viewers of the webinar tonight? Sure. Uh, my name is Stephanie Veens. I teach eighth grade English language arts at Morton Middle School in Fall River. Um, it's a school of about 700 kids, one of five middle schools in the city. So uh, pretty big place. Pretty big city. Nice. And you're an English teacher there in your first year. Yes. Uh, and uh, Rachel, can you introduce yourself to the group as well? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Rachel LeCure. I'm teaching eighth grade English as well at a middle school in North Philadelphia. It's a charter school. Um, it's happening now in Philly. It's a, it's a good place. Great. And Lisa, thank you for joining us. You are also a first year teacher. I'd like you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what, what you're doing uh, teaching this, uh, this semester, this year. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Friesen, and I'm a first year teacher. And uh, this uh, first uh, semester, of uh, this academic year, I worked in three different <clears throat> places uh, in the Manchester Community College, in uh, University of Hartford, which is a private university, and in Central Connecticut State University. So I've had a taste of all possible educational venues of the on the higher uh, level. So. <laughs> And and you're teaching media studies courses primarily, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, so I think it's really great. We have middle school, high school, and uh, community college and university represented uh, tonight by your first year uh, experiences. Uh, so I thought maybe the the next thing for us to do a little bit tonight is to um, is to share a little bit about what you're learning about your students as learners. So why don't we go around the room and talk a little bit about what the discovery process was like beginning in September up until now and what you are learning about your learners. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Okay. Sorry. Do you want to go first, Lisa? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Um, okay, so <laughs> confused. <laughs> you go first. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm working in North Philadelphia, which is an area of Philly that I'm not very familiar with. Um, I've spent most of my time in Center City. So North Philly is a very, very poor area, and my kids are charter school kids. So I didn't. Ha I had no idea what to expect. I've only really ever worked in. Um, in, in kind of suburban areas. So I had, I'm sad to say, I had low expectations. And when I came in, I was like, wow, that's, that's really, that's not nice of me. Like, what's going on? And I was completely blown away by my kids. Um, so they're not picked at this charter school for grades. They are picked for behavior, but they're not chosen for academic standing. My kids are unbelievably bright, uh, which is, exhilarating and exciting. Um, but I also have a huge amount of ESL kids, 
which is something I never experienced as a teacher ever before in my life. Um, so I've been struggling with teaching ESL kids because I don't speak any Spanish and my kids for the most part speak uh, fluent Spanish and they talk in Spanish a lot in my classes which is fun for the most part uh, and exciting so I'm learning a lot of cool new Spanish curse words <laughs> as one would expect from an eighth grade teacher. Um, so I've been, I've been excited and I've been, I don't know, I guess surprised because I, I remember being an eighth grader and not being able to do this much critical thinking and higher learning and they are blowing me away. Wow. Oh, that's a great way to kick us off. Stephanie, what are you learning about your learners? I'm learning that um, their ability to be engaged and to self-regulate socially and emotionally is very much dictated by um, the level that they're at and how challenged they feel. Um, my biggest concern going into the year, being a first year teacher, was where's my curriculum map? What am I supposed to teach? I don't remember what I learned in eighth grade English. You know, what what am I supposed to teach? And you know, once I got into the curriculum, I'm I'm realizing that you know it's an eighth grade curriculum, but 80% of the students read at a fourth or a fifth grade level. Um, and so what they're interested in isn't so much a product of their actual interest, but more what they can handle. So I can give structured worksheets all day, and they're all over it, even if it's the most boring stuff in the world. Um, but when I push them to think critically and to do sustained reading and to write, um, they struggle, and that's when the behaviors come out, um, because struggle it, it manifests as frustration and anger um, and it, it almost seems like they're not sure how to embrace challenge. Wow, what a great observation about that complicated sweet spot. If it's too challenging, you lose them and yet where is that sweet spot? Especially for kids who might not be reading at grade level. Dave, mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about what you're learning about your uh, high school students yeah. uh, in, in, your, in your school? I think appropriately it's a little mix of the of the two that we just heard from that um, on the one hand I was blown away by some of the ideas and the passion that I get from my students and on the other hand they're all especially at my school because it is an alternative high school for students who for a lot of different reasons didn't complete a, a more traditional high school education um, they're all over the map with everything, with reading level, with, um, you know, I, I got my first glimpse of it when I did a, just a basic, like, typing lesson, and that was interesting because, number one, they loved the typing lesson way more than the critical thinking lessons. They, they really enjoyed typing. But two, when I looked at their actual, like, words per minute, um, I had kids that could type 40 words a minute, and I had words that, uh, kids that could type five words a minute. And those kinds of gaps across... Um, all of my students are, are kind of everywhere, right? And, and they're very unpredictable. So my lesson planning has been a real challenge because it needs to be rigorous enough that I'm engaging with them with critical thinking, but I can't just assign whatever I want in terms of readings, in terms of, um, you know, in terms of writing assignments and other things. So I'm trying to find that, that sweet spot for, like, every different student who all have different needs depending on where they're coming from. So... That's been the biggest surprise to me coming from a, like a college setting where you don't really have to care about that stuff, which is a, kind of a callous thing to say, but you know, the, the kids that don't have the foundational skills in college, they just end up failing or going to the writing center, and you don't have to deal with that directly. Um, and so having to be fully responsible for that for every student has been, um, I mean, it's been good, but it's been challenging, so that's kind of where I've been at. Wow, what a fascinating insight that in high school we have to care about uh, student learning maybe yeah. more than we have to care about it in higher ed. A very interesting and, and, and complicated reality. Um, so you've told us a little bit about uh, what you're learning about your students. Now I'd like to hear a little bit about what you're learning about your colleagues because uh, teaching is not a solo sport. Right? Uh, you're in, engaged in an enterprise with a bunch of other grown-ups in the building. And as a first-year teacher, you not only have to learn about your students, but you also kind of have to learn about your colleagues. 
Tell us what you're learning about your colleagues. They're part of the equation as a first year. Mm -hmm. What are you learning about your colleagues? So I, I mean, I can start just because we have a very small staff. Uh, there are only, I think, nine teachers in the whole school, so we all know each other really well. Um, and it's it's interesting because on the one hand, everyone is scheduled to de There's not a spare moment to actually collaborate, but if you really wanted to, you could do some collaboration. So we've had a little bit of opportunity to talk to each other, and part of that is just having such a small team that when you see that connection, you can kind of jump on it. Whereas I imagine if there are more teachers in the equation, um, that can be a lot harder. Um, we, we had an opportunity before school started to do a media-based professional development activity that I helped out, sort of, um, helped out with where everyone actually got to complete a very small media production. Um, they did like screencasts of PowerPoints with photographs and did like a, a personal reflection. And so um, every teacher was able to kind of have that like low low production experience um, before we started, and that was a good way um, not to get the projects running, but to just connect to each other as you know as human beings, which was important. But again, I imagine that's a lot more difficult when you have more teachers. So yeah, but it sounds like that was a really cool approach to professional development. Yeah, it was great. Case uh, an intriguing way to think about building a sense of community through a shared or through a a, a media production experience that kind of serves as a another way of getting to know you. Yeah. Intriguing. Uh, Rachel, Stephanie, what are you learning about your uh, colleagues in the building? Uh, I'm learning that uh, birds of a feather flock together. So it is, you know, there's about <laughs> 50 or so of us, I think. Um, and, and it's a little bit clicky, which makes me sad to say, but the groupings are very much based on different educational philosophies, why we're there, why we're doing what we're doing, how we feel about curriculum versus classroom management. Um, more so than learning about individual colleagues, I'm learning a lot about the school as a system, and um, particularly when it comes to grades and the value of grades and do you fail students that actually haven't done any work or do you give them a D and pass them along so I'm um, becoming exposed to the realities of public education I guess. And fascinating to learn that uh, teachers align themselves with uh, people of similar values and interests and that you've been able to recognize that or find some of those where the some of those fault lines are already even in just the last couple of months. Uh, Rachel, what are you learning from and about your colleagues? And fascinating to learn that uh, teachers align themselves. Somebody has a window open. Uh, 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 hey Sarah. Hi Sarah, you are, you're joining us. We're glad you're joining us. Yeah, but you have a window open. Some of those, where the, some of those uh, lines are. Close that down, okay? Just the last couple of months. Oh, uh oh. About your colleagues. Sarah, Sarah, turn off that window. Which window? Which window? Window open. Somebody has a window open. That's. Oh. If, if everybody who's not talking just mutes their microphone, that should take care of it. That. Thank you, Dave. That could do it. Did it work? No, we still we're still hearing it. You have a window open, or somebody has a window open. That's a problem. Try muting your microphone. See if that works. So, welcome to Kathy Leo Grand, Elizaveta Friesum, Zoe Wong, and Sarah Ben joining us to participate in this discussion. Uh, ladies, I'm going to ask you to generate a couple of questions to our first year teachers. But first, we're going to hear from Rachel a little bit about what she's learning from and about the colleagues that she's been uh, teaching with for the last few months. Rachel? Um, one of the, th I mean, I'm, I'm echoing this. Uh, my school also has cliques within the teachers, which I was a little disappointed to find out um, because we've all been assigned a mentor teacher as a new teacher. So we get someone else who's teaching the same subject um, who's been there longer. My mentor teacher and I have literally no time to hang out. I've we've seen each other in passing in the hallways. We our hallways, our classrooms are across from each other. That's it. There's because of her extra duties and my extra duties at the end of school. By the time we're going home, 
we've seen each other for maybe 10 minutes. All of our communication happens over the phone, it happens through email, it happens after, like significantly after school, it's like, I don't want to do work at 6 o'clock, I want to have dinner. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, that's frustrating. Um, especially as a new teacher where it's like, well, you're my point person and I have no time to ever talk to you. Um, right. Yeah, and so a lot of the other teachers, the time, simply just the scheduling means I eat lunch alone because there's no one there. No one else has that period off. Everyone eats lunch alone. Everyone kind of has all our prep periods or so. Yeah, they're so awkward and like mismatched that I don't see anyone else who teaches eighth grade throughout my entire day. Wow, so you're actually yeah. experiencing a fair amount of isolation. Oh yeah, except for my students, I'm totally alone all day. Wow, holy shamoly, that's wild. Um, all right, so um, uh, why don't we talk a little bit about how digital and media literacy is entering into your experience as a first-year teacher. Is there time? Have you gotten a chance to uh, explore the digital and media literacy competencies of your students? And what stories can you tell us about whether or not you've been able to um, incorporate media literacy uh, activities or concepts into your teaching? Dave, I guess I would start with you because I have to assume as the media teacher, right. you get to do this, right? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm of the three of us, I'm in the privileged position of getting to teach kind of whatever I want to. Um, the complicated reality of it is that when you have media expertise and that's what you teach at the school, nobody actually pays very much attention to what you're teaching um, because they assume that because you know how to use computers and media and are considered to be kind of an expert teacher in it, that anything that you're teaching must be fine. Um, that's not entirely true, but but there is a bit of a black box that I have that other teachers do not have, uh, in that I do not have shared curricular goals for technology integration or for, for media production, even though those kind of exist. Um, nobody that is paying attention to the educational um, objectives really cares about that stuff. Um, but what's interesting is that I find that my, my, my teaching is mostly overlapping with like English social studies and very occasionally with the science class and uh, I try to get some math in there. So I have the weird experience of kids resenting me for making them do like social studies kind of stuff and for writing things and for not having the computers on one day um, because their other teachers would like put on movies and that was how media happens, you know. Um, and it's like, well, no, I mean, this is just in incorporating media into this other important stuff, but they see that as other subjects. So my weird um, problem is that it's really easy for me to do a simplified version of dig digital media literacy that is just about media, but it's hard for me to reach out and actually do the other subjects that I want to do that are all a part of it. So the, the hard thing is that holistic vision for it less than the technology integration part, um, which is kind of funny. My, my students always know when I'm, like, doing social studies, and that's not okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Fascinating. And it's weird to think, where did they get those ideas from? Yeah. Right? Because they brought those in. But they brought those attitudes in, that this was separate and isolated from yeah. other subject areas. They, they learned that somewhere. <laughs> so, Stephanie, have you been able to have um, media literacy in a, a place in your English classroom in the eighth grade? Um, well, I have a couple things I want to say about that, so I'll try to be brief, but piggybacking on what David said, there is a very compartmentalized view of where and when media happens, um, and I'm lucky enough that my administration does have a strong eye on digital literacy and goals to integrate that, um, but it hasn't really made its way out of the explicitly tech-based classes, coding classes, TV production classes, media classes. Um, it hasn't really yet seeped into the core classes, so I'm hoping to pull some of that in. Uh, I didn't really think I would find myself saying that I struggle to find time to do media literacy because as a grad student studying this kind of thing, talking to educators, surveying educators, a lot of them would say, I don't have the time. And my thinking as a student um, was, well, media literacy is designed to be integrated into what you're already doing, so it shouldn't take you any extra time. I was totally wrong about that. Uh, 
I suppose once you have sort of a collection of go-to media literacy things that you can do that are established and accessible and you're used to it, I think it can actually save time, but the initial learning curve of how to integrate it, it's like I, I meant to do a whole bunch of media literacy stuff over Christmas break and it didn't happen. So um, time is definitely a factor. Where I have been trying to squeeze in some principles of media literacy um, is more leaning towards media analysis where anytime we read a text or watch a short clip, I, I push them to think about, well, who wrote this? Where did that person come from? How is that person different from where you came from and what your values are? Um, so kind of pushing the idea of multiple perspectives that they can carry with them when we do get to the more uh, media literate stuff. Wow, very interesting. A lot of insight there, and I can definitely <laughs> see the makings of a great op-ed in that interesting tension around uh, layering it in versus I don't have the time. Rachel, what's been your experience with media literacy and your job at the Esperanza Middle School teaching English? Have you had time to do any media literacy or why or why not? Uh-oh, we can't hear you. Unmute your microphone. Oh man, and even told me to do that. Wow. <laughs> um, unfortunately, not nearly as much as I'd like, but we have gotten a little bit in. Um, we struggle with honestly just getting access to any media so we are we're also working on creating the curriculum as we teach it which is uh, not what I expected and was much more difficult than I expected it to be um, so the stuff that we have focused on is, has been censorship because we just read the giver which is very censorship focused um, and we've been talking about audience and author and it, it's hard. It's way harder than I thought it would be. Um, which is frustrating. As someone who grew up with media literacy as m part of my whole life, I thought it would be much easier. And so, yeah, not nearly as much as I would have hoped. Can, you, can you help us understand what you meant by the phrase, you're making the curriculum as you go along? I think that's something that many first-year teachers can relate to, but not we don't all understand that the same way what's that what's that mean for you in the context of this this job that you're making up the curriculum as you go along um, so my co-teacher was charged with writing the curriculum um, and that was like her summer they switched up the whole middle school this is the first time with two teachers they joined a bunch of students so the middle school made a huge expansion so the curriculum they had before was not pretty much non-existent so they said, read three books, pick any books you'd like, here's, you know, some paperwork that you should include, here's the Common Core State Standards, and that's it, that's it, that's all they gave us. And she wrote a really wonderful unit for the giver, and we have nothing else at all. And so we're reading Raisin in the Sun, we start on Monday, and I have done, I don't, I've read, read the book. But I have no materials. I have no, I have no idea what to do. So that's scary because a lot of it is the week before. I'm like, cool. What are we focusing on? What's what are we going to write at the end? Are we doing a test? Are we doing an essay? Are we doing a project? And I'm kind of making that up as I go along, which is hard. So the first like two months, I was drowning. Um, and it's been a lot better now. We've kind of cooperated more. It was like, cool, let's all do the same things. Me and the other teacher. Like, we'll write the same essays. That'll make it way easier. Um, but it's scary to have kind of no end goal and not really know. The state standards are so confusing, and they're some of them are really vague, and some of them are things that I simply cannot do because we don't have the resources. Um, and, like, no one in Philly has those resources, so no one in Philly can do that, uh, which is... Frustrating? Yeah. Well, so, that's what we're dealing with. So, Stephanie and Dave, I'm kind of curious about how does that relate or where is the place of uh, disconnect or connect with that idea? Are you making it up as you're going along and what's that feel like? What's the, what's the, what's the emotional impact of that for you? Well, I'm, I'm totally making it up as I go along. I, I designed a beautiful syllabus before I realized that high school students aren't used to reading syllabi and keeping track of them over the course of a... We did that too. Um, so I made a kick-ass syllabus that nobody ever read. 
Um, and then I realized as I'm going along that you that that high school doesn't work that way. Like if if the project's not done, you don't just like move on to the next thing. If the project's not done, you go an extra day or an extra week to finish it, and then everything gets pushed. So what I've been doing is l- luckily I've, I've always been very like product based in my thinking. Like there are three things that have to happen by the end of the whatever. We have cycles that are nine weeks, so that's kind of my my unit of time is nine weeks. Um, And so students need to have created these three things in nine weeks. And so on top of all of the, you know, normal issues that you have at at a school like mine where you have kids that, you know, they need to not be in school for a week because they're in court or they're like, you know, they have temporary housing and while they're getting that figured out, they can't be at school every day. Um, so I need something that is flexible enough that students can just create three things before the end of the cycle, and if that's an essay or a video or whatever. Um, and so that's actually been helpful because I've shifted my mindset from that idea of like that linear curricular map to a more cyclical one, where like there are certain days of the week where we do certain things, and each of those things builds to a um, product that is 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 being done. We have a couple of days to do the work for it. Um, like Rachel, my students don't have very much computer access at home. I did a media, which is very helpful. I recommend if you're especially working with um, uh, students who you're not sure about what kind of media access they have. I just had everybody do like a media, like a home media survey, and 90% of my students have smartphones with wireless or internet capability, um, and only 40% of them have access to a computer at home. Um, and so that changed everything. Anyway, so. Um, I'm getting off track a little bit, but yeah, so so it's been bizarre because like I, I keep on rewriting things every every week. I have to go week by week, um, and the only thing that's constant is this idea that something has to come out of like there has to be a product at the end of it. Um, so I don't know if that's anybody else's experience, but it's certainly you know drowning is a good uh, good metaphor for it. I think, or at least treading water, you know, is, is how I feel. Stephanie, are you? Thank you for sharing that, Dave. That's very insightful, and I think especially this idea of having a a, a, a chunk of time where something has to get created is a yeah. nice structure. Uh, Stephanie, are you making it up as you go along? And what 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 kind of received curriculum have you got it to support you, or or uh, uh, how how are you handling that feeling of drowning? Uh, I'm not making it up as I go along, which at the beginning of the year, I was so, so thankful for that we have nice chunked out term units. Um, But there are times when I think I might be better off making it up uh, myself. But, uh, and that mostly comes from the curriculum being, you know, up here and seeing my students' frustration level with it. Um, So what I'm doing, uh, and my curriculum exists uh, primarily in people's brains that I have to pick. There's not, you know, the linear curriculum map, so to speak. Um, So what I'm doing is kind of taking the established curriculum, um, basing it on what the other eighth grade English teacher is doing, and then modifying for um, what I think will work with my students. So I I do have a guide, which is nice. Uh Aha! Fascinating! Uh, Okay, so I'm really, really delighted that we've got a bunch of amazing media literacy experts on the call with us. I see Kathy Leogrand, of course, Elizaveta Freytham. I see Natasha. Uh, I see Natasha. I see uh, uh, Zoe Wong. I see Sarah Ben. Uh, how about you guys tell us a little bit about what you're learning about uh, first year teaching, uh, what you remember about your own experience as a first year teaching. And then I wonder if you have any questions or comments uh, that you'd like to share with the first year teachers in the in the room. Who wants to go first? Kathy? I can go first. No? Go ahead, we can hear you. Okay, Kathy, Kathy you accidentally turned your microphone off, so turn it back on. Is it on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What's striking me is that I've been a teacher educator for 25 years and we keep trying to do everything we can before the first year, even before student teaching, to help people spend that time productively to cut down this disconnect. And and I just, I'm not sure there's anything other than just being totally immersed in it 
-hmm. and having a little angel on your shoulder, a, a, Renee's voice in your head saying, why do you think this is? What's going on now? Because these stories just, it's like that first year is, like David said, treading water. That first, no matter where you went to school, no matter what your program was, no matter, it's it just, I, it's such a funny profession. It's it's so different from all the other professions because it's so idiosyncratic to the kids and the colleagues and all the different factors that are there. So I, I guess that's just I'm sitting here in awe of you all, all coming at it from different places and saying so many of the same kinds of things that you're for every day you're tilting at windmills. So that's what I took from this. <laughs> <laughs> such a great observation. Uh, Sarah, Zoe, Elizaveta, Ed, Natasha, what comments or questions do you have for our first year teachers? Um, I wanted to ask a question. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice, I just, my voice sounds so weird. I'm having a really bad cold. Um, I've heard um, all your experiences and your, you know, um, um, make it as um, you making up your curriculum as you go, and I was wondering how much of creative teaching or and um, versus teaching creativity happens in your first year of teaching, and what do you what kind of obstacles that you are seeing or you are experiencing, what you are afraid of experiencing in the future. Um, in terms of creatively teaching or teaching creative uh, creativity in <clears throat> in your um, career, that's a good question. Where well, what's what's going on with your creativity as teachers and your identity as a creative individual? Is that shifting or transforming in some way? Especially as, as a first year teacher, I, I can see a lot of like. Um, unknown um, things that are going on and are you thinking about it or what are the obstacles that you are thinking um, maybe you were, you're facing? Dave, you want to first on that? So I, one thing I've been thinking about a lot is that my creativity can sometimes do a disservice to what my students actually need. That I can be really creative and come up with the coolest thing um, but if it's not what my students actually need, you know, if, they, if there are skills that I'm missing that they don't have prior to doing my creative thing, if there's background knowledge that I'm taking for granted that they don't have, um, then it really blows up in my face in a way that, you know, a more, um, uh, like, I, I don't want to call it a safer lesson, but a lesson that I wouldn't see as, like, my most creative lesson, you know, would be, like, uh, um, I, um, you know, just really simple stuff like, like you know, the I, I think I don't know if this is on the call or, or before the call, but I just did like a basic like typing lesson with my students where I had them copy hip hop lyrics or song lyrics. I mean, they mostly chose hip hop um, and paste them into like a custom typing exercise, and it was like 50 minutes. Like they didn't want to stop. It was like 50 minutes of totally focused attention. It was the greatest one day lesson I've taught this entire for my entire teaching time. And it was something that I thought was so uncreative that I was almost like offended that I even did it. And they loved it. And, you know, it was just because I hadn't actually taken those steps to figure out, well, like, you know, can they type? Can they do this? Can they do this? Um, there's some really basic stuff that I didn't really know or I thought I knew but I didn't really know. Um, and so if you miss those points, and they can be much subtler than whether you can type. You know, it can be, um, you know, I, I have a big problem with um, my students are very overly cynical but in the right political and philosophical direction around things like income inequality, but they, they go so far in terms of their cynicism that they get into almost conspiracy theories. And so how I teach things like news, which I'm trying to teach this, uh, this cycle, um, is really complicated because I can't indulge them in being completely mistaken about certain things, but their hearts are in the right place, so I don't want to try to give them a line that is going to take away their passion, you know, it's, it's complicated, so I'm going to stop there, but um, yeah, my, my creativity can, can throw everybody off the rails a little bit, so I need to rein it in a little bit sometimes. <laughs> fascinating, fascinating. Stephanie, what's going on with your creative self, your creative identity as a teacher? In terms of my creativity, I find that if I try to do something that's too out of the box, it's kind of something they've never seen before, and they withdraw, and they don't know what it is, and so then you get the 
anger and social social emotional manifestations. Um, I have been pleasantly surprised with their reaction to opportunities where they get to be creative. Um, for example, I was doing a vocabulary lesson. Um, the, the room was set up in station, so I was working on something else with a small group of students, and I need something um, that students could work on independently, and it was vocabulary. Um, and this is where the time thing comes in, because I know I have so many resources on media literacy and vocabulary, but um, finding the time was tough. So what I did, they had to define the word in so many ways and then just make um, draw a picture and come up with a sentence and illustrate the sentence using the word um, and they loved it and they had all these like crazy pictures with like monsters and all kinds of weird things um, and they just loved it they didn't want to stop so um, with a nod to Kathy's comment it, it it can be really simple but if they get to be creative then you know they like it and then there's a little bit of fear that you know what happens if my administration walks in and the kids are coloring. Is that a bad thing? But they're so engaged. Um, so I, I like to see them when they're being creative, but I worry if those creative moments are rigorous enough. Mm, fascinating. Uh, so Rachel, what about your own uh, creative identity and your students' creativity? Uh, what's How are you thinking about yourself in relation to the concept of creativity in teaching and learning? Um, I've definitely struggled with my own creativity. Um, I think just because I, I don't feel like the, cre the type of creative I am fits directly. I'm very hands-on and physical with my creativity, so it, I, I don't know. I haven't found really a way to use that quite yet. Um, yet. But my students... Um, I kind of accidentally stumbled on something that they had never done before and like they were super engaged in. We did it. We ended up doing it for two whole days because they, they did not want to stop. Um, we're writing a, a memory from, so we're reading The Giver. We just finished it. Um, and they had to give, they had to give me a memory. So you know in the thing, in the book, Jonas puts his hands, or The Giver puts his hand on Jonas and gives Jonas a memory of the world before. And the kids were really, they were like, that's so sci-fi. They don't like sci-fi. They don't get it. They're like, it's very Star Trek. I'm like, no, this is wonderful. That's a great thing. And they find, they think that's insulting. In its own way, insulting. Um, and so I had them to give me a memory, but I really restricted their word use. And these are my ESL kids, so telling them they can't use words seemed really silly. And I was like, but they want, they want them to use words. Um, so I took out pretty much all pronouns. So you couldn't use I or me or so no personal pronouns. Um, and you had to give me a memory like it was someone else's memory. You couldn't talk about yourself. And I was like, these kids are going to hate it. They're going to be like, um, Kira, don't make me do it. No one wants to do it. And they loved it. And the stories they wrote are phenomenal. It was, was mind-blowing. It was like, oh, cool. I could copy and paste this and put it into the book and no one would know. And these are these are eighth grade kids who some of them speak so little English. Where it's like, how did you do this? Like, what did you do? Um, and I thought it was like a simple lesson that I kind of just pulled out of nowhere. Was like, I don't know what to do today. I didn't make any good plans. This worksheet sucks. Like, let's do this thing instead. Wow. wow. What's, what's I don't know. It's happening. What's, what's beautiful, about about that, that, beautiful about that story is the way it illustrates uh, what. Zoe, you know to be a key feature of creativity, which is that it tends to flower when under constraint, right? That, you know, you bind it up and then it gets unleashed, right? So you gave constraints that in a way freed them to be creative, which is really intriguing. Um, so thank you, uh, Kathy and Zoe, for asking great questions. It's now that time of the night when we do the Media Education Lab tradition, highlights and lowlights. We're really trying to model the idea of reflective practice, and it's so hard with the isolation of teaching and the making it up as you go along and the, the all the many challenges of a first-year teacher. It's hard to find time and space for reflection, but we'll try to do it here in our webinar tonight. So the rules for highlights and lowlights are pretty simple. Uh, we go around the room, and uh, first, first we reflect on our lowlights, because Lord knows 
we have had them and first year teachers have have them in spades so if you can share at least one just one really meaningful low light and why it was a low light then we'll go around the room and share a highlight and then we'll get feedback and thoughts from our 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 audience tonight who who's listening okay so that's the plan low light starting with a low light not fun to go first on this. I have one. Go ahead. Um, my low light is my biggest challenge, and I get really upset about this every single day. But I'm trying to figure out how to pay attention to the students that are thriving, to the, the you know the good students, when my attention is so focused on the classroom management and the students that are not being successful. Um, there are so many days, or the other day in particular, we're doing a writing assignment and my super focused, super thriving students, you know, they're saying, Miss Beans, can you read this? Can you check this? Am I doing it right? I really want you to read this and give me feedback. And I have to say no, because on the other side of the room, there's one student uh, shoving a sandwich in another one's face. One has his desk over his head and is spinning around, and two others are chasing each other around the room. And I'm like, I, and then I have this, this sweet kid saying, please read my essay, please read my essay. Um, so my low light is feeling like I'm disservicing the thriving students and maybe paying too much attention to the ones that aren't on the bandwagon, but I can't ignore them because then they'll never be on the bandwagon. So... Just trying to get everyone on board and, and divide my tension equally has been my low light. That is a formidable challenge and a real low light indeed. Thanks for sharing. Rachel, what's a low light? Thinking back September, October, November, December, what's a low light that you'd like to share with us? It's been a real challenge or difficulty for you. Um, sounds really silly, but... My biggest low light has been writing lessons. I find that I have a really hard time planning in advance, but I can describe what I did, but I can't describe it before I've done it. And I don't, I'm an on the fly person. I do things as that's, I've always worked that way. I work best that way. I, and so I wrote this syllabus and I have planned lessons and I don't think a single solitary week have I done even some of those things that I write down. It's really hard for observations where it's like, cool, I guess we got to do this thing because I wrote it down, but like I wrote it down and I don't like it now. Now it's terrible and it's awkward and it's like, oh my God, who wants to do, no one wants to do that. And so I, I don't, I feel stuck because I feel like I have to do these and I have, it's part of my, I have to write these lesson plans and give them every week and they have to be certain detailed and formatted and I those, I feel like those are holding me back. Mm. Um, but as a first year teacher, I can't not do that. And no one's going to believe me that I can do it. I'm, I'm like okay without a lesson plan. So I don't know. That feels angering and frustrating and constraining. And I don't, I don't know. It's rubbing me the wrong way. Thanks for sharing. That's definitely a complicated uh, identity position because lesson plans are for the administrative oversight, right? So, important. Uh, yeah, so there's definitely a complicating thing around your conflicted loyalties, loyalty, loyalty to yourself, loyalty to the to the school leadership. Uh, Dave, how about a low light that uh, you've been struck yeah. or that was a meaningful low light for you, and wh why it why it mattered? Well, I mean, I got hit by a car my uh, my first my third week teaching my fifth week at the job and I was out for five weeks which was very difficult but it was not a low light because it was just this otherworldly thing that happened um, and I actually appreciated the time to like get my feet wet and then have a couple of weeks. It's actually not a bad teaching cycle, one month on, one month off. It's not bad. Um, but um, no, the real low light for me has been uh, just coming to, to grips with the fact that I am really bad at like classroom management and when I can theorize about this stuff I can talk about how classroom management is 
you know, behavioral control and it's all, you know, frere and all this other stuff. But at the same time, like when I get into the class and there's four kids that will not just let up and, and nobody else can do anything, I have to take some classroom management techniques out of the most regressive, like I'm going to write you up for that stuff. And I, and I feel like that's not what I have to do, but right now it's all I have in my toolbox. I, like I haven't successfully gotten through any of my progressive alternative ways of dealing with conflict. Um, and so until then, you know, I, 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 I'm threatening and I'm doing this stuff that I'm just like, I don't, I, I, this isn't me. Like I don't, you know, I don't want to be the guy that, that writes you up for, for goofing off or, you know, sleeping in class. It's just stuff that comes up every day that is just such um, a pain in the butt because it, if it detracts from everybody else's learning, you have to deal with it. It's, I mean, I, I'm relating to, um, to what you were saying, Stephanie, where, you know, if, if, there's a, if there's a desk on a head somewhere and it's endangering another student, like, you, you have to pause for a second and deal with that. And um, it doesn't happen as much as it could happen, but I know that a lot of what's happening is just because I haven't kind of clicked into that mold of the teacher with the, author the kind of authority that students are kind of expecting in a classroom. Um, and part of that comes out of the media literacy background and part of that comes out of inexperience. And so that's been a low light for me just, just personally because I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, I really need to be somebody that I'm not, or I feel like I need to be somebody that I'm not in this particular situation because I haven't figured out a better way so that I can still be like true to myself and make this work, you know. And so that's been a big low light just dealing with, you know, just the really most basic classroom management stuff. I hate it. Uh, like, because, you know, my students are older, but it's not just that. It would, I would have the same problem in eighth grade or fifth grade of, like, you know, sending somebody to the principal's office for goofing off. I mean, I just, I, I don't want to do that <laughs> ever. So it's been difficult for me. Thanks for sharing that issue of how we navigate our own authority position in the classroom is like not something you figure out in a year or three years even it's a it's a long journey and it's it's I guess it's a part of the struggle that is about the identity and like you said about you want to be the sometimes you have to be the teacher you don't want to be yeah. and that's not fun the first year of teaching and it's not fun any year of teaching and yet I'd say it still happens to all of us across the whole lifespan sometimes um, all right, so we turn to highlights, and then we'll get some reaction and feedback from our audience members. Share a highlight. My, mine is easy to... Super meaningful and wonderful. Dave? Yeah, mine's the flip side of what I just told you, which is that I have, I have one period that is particularly difficult, and I feel like every day it's a battle, and I'm focusing so much on classroom management, all my lessons keep going out the window. But the school district visited one day, and, and my, my students are very good about school district visits because they've seen a lot of the, the worst of the Philly public school system. So they know that actually the school is pretty good as an alternative to what they're used to. And so when the school district comes, everyone is really focused um, because they want it to be a good, a good visit. And so my, my, my sixth period class, which has felt like this huge struggle, the school district person walks into this class and immediately all eyes are on me. Everyone is sitting up straight, paying close attention. And so I start asking them about stuff that we've been learning over the course of the cycle, and they are going, like, they're going off topic to make connections to previous <coughs> so They're learning. Like, I got that rare, quiet opportunity to actually probe them to see if they've been learning. We took a thing on Trump, and we talked about Donald Trump for a second. It was amazing. And so afterwards, when the school district person left, they were, they were like, oh, this is a, a great lesson. He was, like, picking up these threads. I'm like, that hasn't happened before in this class, ever. Like, that only happened once when you were visiting. But at the same time, it gave me, like, a new confidence to keep going because I'm like, oh, they're learning this stuff. Like, like I know, like, it feels like a struggle, but, like, that's my evidence that everything that I'm doing here has actually, like, taken some hold. So that was amazing. Wow, what an amazing story. And it yeah. also speaks about the concept of audience. Yes, and yeah. So audience where they had to demonstrate that was yeah. an authentic audience for them. It was an authentic. To demonstrate their learning. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so. Wow. That was an awesome okay. highlight. That was a pretty good highlight. Rachel, tell us a highlight, something wonderful in the last three months that was wonderful. Uh, I was really wrapped up in that story and didn't think of my own. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, come back to me, please. Come back to me. <laughs> so, Steph, Steph, a, a little wonderful or a big wonderful. 
Uh, my highlight is just the genuine, authentic relationships I've been able to create with these students. Um, for every one student that hates my guts and thinks I'm Satan, there's two that just by the way most of these students walk and talk and carry themselves, um, there's a lot of students that really don't have adults in their lives that are just there for them and super supportive. Uh, and I, I am that person for some of them. There are students that come to me after school and they, you know, will have tears streaming down their face and they say, Ms. Beans, can I talk to you? I really just need to talk to someone. Um, and maybe that has nothing to do with ELA, but um, it's a highlight for me knowing that I get to be that person for some of them because they need it. Wow. And I'm okay with that. They, they, they trust and respect you and they understand that there's a, re a real relationship there and that means you're showing them trust and respect so they want to be in they want to be in your life that's that's pretty that's a pretty good thing to happen in the first uh, three or four months of school congratulations Rachel you have a highlight to share something wonderful yes I thought of one um, so I have one kid in my class who's, he is an ESL kid, and he's just out of the ESL English class, so he's very, very new to the language. Mm -hmm. um, and we correct sentences a lot in the class because I find sentence structure to, I thought that they were good at that, and that was not a true statement. So we've been doing a lot of that since September. And he, the, for the first time, he raised his hand and correctly conjugated the word C to C. He got, and C is a weird one, it's got saw, and most of my kids think that seen is like an appropriate, that you can, I seen something, no, that's not a thing, you don't seen things. Uh, he correctly did it, he did completely, and I, I was like, I just kind of stood there in shock for a second, he was like, was I right? It's like, oh, you totally were, I'm sorry, you've just like never spoken during any of my classes ever, and you totally knew this. Um... And so to see him make that progress was like, oh, cool, they are learning. Like, whew, they're figuring something out. Like, all right, we're good. No one's going to not, I'm not totally messing these kids up. Nice. So that, was, that was wonderful. He's learning. Like, Evidence he learned of that from us. Right. We taught him that. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. So let's hear from our members of the audience. What questions or comments do you, what themes or patterns do you notice in these reflections of highlights and moments? Um, so can I go? Is that okay? Yep. Okay. First of all, I don't know if it's a highlight. It's, it's definitely a highlight. I am honored and privileged to be in this group. We are an amazing group of educators to be able to articulate the reality of, of the profession the way that you have. Amazing. Um, and, and I guess the only comment that I would make is that I'm 61, I've been teaching for a really long time, <laughs> and I could identify with every one of those statements. When I teach a new class at college, when I have a different level of students, graduate or undergraduate, it's the same. This is the most awesome, draining, exciting, frustrating profession in the world, and I don't I wouldn't do anything else, but thank you for the honor of being in your group because you've just re-energized me as an educator. So um, you're amazing. Thank you, Sethi. I agree with you. I find I, fi I find these first year teachers very inspiring. It, does, it is interesting to think of some patterns that exist. Lisa, do you do you have any observations or uh, reflections on the first year teaching experience from what you've been listening to, or from what you've been experiencing as a first year teacher yourself? Um, well, I had I have had a lot of different thoughts, and I won't cover all of them right now. But uh, first of all, I agree uh, that I could relate to a lot of things that were said. So it's nice, you know, when you are teaching on your own and you think, oh my God, like I'm dealing with all this stuff and everybody else probably is doing great and like don't have, uh, nobody has these problems and then you listen to other people and they actually have very similar problems and you feel better. Uh, not like a schadenfreude thing, but thinking like, oh, okay, so it's, you know, you, you, it, it will never go away. It just, it's a sign, it's, I just, I just learned to see it as a sign of uh, 
good teacher. The fact that we are all, you know, struggling with that and thinking about it, it means that we care. Um, so for me, that was also a very um, an energizing experience to to feel like I'm not alone. <laughs> Such a great point that, in fact, the fact that teachers, we're experiencing this is because we care. I mean, that's actually a really good point to underline. Uh, Sarah, I know you are a, not quite a first year teacher, but you're a second year teacher. Do you have any reflections on what you've been hearing and listening to tonight in terms of patterns or observations that you noticed? Um, well, I, I really liked the lowlights and I saw them as actually huge opportunities for a lot of the teachers because in terms of having like restraints on resources, I think I heard like not a lot of technology. I think for my classes sometimes I have them pretend do tweets like on the bulletin board, have them go home, cut out images because they're still being media literate when they come back in. So the creativity is just finding your own niche, you know, what would make sense outside the classroom to bring it in the classroom as an assignment, you know, do a Twitter feed on the blackboard, have them learn how to do that and talk about, I'm doing that celebrity quiz, so I'm just like, bring in a celebrity, let's talk about the celebrity images, um, but I think the fact that you have restraints is the opportunity to learn, because anytime I learn is always when I have some kind of struggle. So. Yeah. Yeah, and in some ways, that's a really interesting way to think about the lowlights as a, a, a kind of a place where, you know, we as teachers are learners and to be authentic with our students. And this is where, you know, we're trying to develop and grow. Um, okay, so we've reached nearly the end of the journey. And the a thing I've asked the first year teachers to do as our closing uh, activity is to offer a New Year's resolution. Because you can only do that once a year. And it is kind of neat to think about like how you'll be different as a teacher 365 days from now. So if you will, first year teachers, make a New Year's resolution about one little thing that you hope you will be able to do in the next 365 days as you continue on your journey as an educator. I have one. Try more things that come from my own brain and my own creativity and not what someone tells me to do. Um, really, really quick example of something that I did try. We are reading a text by uh, Malcolm Gladwell, the book Outliers. There's a chapter called 10,000 Hour Rule. Macklemore, the rapper, has a song called 10,000 Hour Rule that was inspired by the text. And I was so excited about that. I'm like, we're going to annotate the song lyrics. It's going to be great. Uh, and all that happened was they wanted to hear the song to hear the inappropriate language and it kind of fell flat and so I haven't tried anything since and I think my resolution is to kind of pick myself up by the bootstraps and say who cares if it fell flat I just need to try it again maybe next time it'll work so I need to try more things a lot of insight there my experience is I'm the happiest teacher when half of what I try is failing <laughs> I, that's when I'm the best teacher I can be is when half the time it's not working and that's the sweet spot for me so getting more comfortable with failure trying more things that's a good New Year's resolution uh, Rachel you have a New Year's resolution that you want to share with us one nope. uh, your thing went away you sorry. sorry so Rachel do you have a New Year's resolution something you hope to be doing in the next 365 days that will be uh, part of your journey of adventure as an educator? Yeah, I really, really want to collaborate with my co-teachers more. Uh, like, desperately I want to do that. Um, especially the social studies teacher. Um, I find that she, simply social studies and English go so well together, and we have an ad no point met, really, and talked about anything other than like, oh, who are you? Um, so my goal is to talk to her and to learn more about what they're doing in that classroom because all I hear is what the kids do and they're like oh yeah we talk wow so there's a real opportunity 
for you and the social studies teachers to do at least one thing together in the next year. That would be awesome. Dave, do you have a New Year's resolution for yourself as on your education journey this year? Yeah, I, I think for me it's 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 almost um it's not the opposite of what Stephanie said, but it's the uh, it's the flip side to it, which is I don't have a lot of the structures in place that I need for my students to know when they come in, like what the expectations are. I think, um, and and so building some of those systems that can take care of some of the work of when I do want to try to throw a Macklemore song on, right? For me, um, you know, I, I you know I'm throwing Macklemore songs at them every day in in the in the, in the metaphor there, and um, I think that having more systems in place that are kind of steady, and so that even if you know, no matter how exciting the lesson is, there's always kind of like a like a baseline of of learning, right? That's I want to establish my baseline that I feel comfortable in, that that we kind of click into a groove, and I feel like I'm not there yet. Um, not just because of inexperience, but because I don't actually have the systems in place. I haven't thought them through well enough yet. Um, and so that's kind of my New Year's resolution is to have everything in the classroom set so that the creativity has something to, you know, has like a you know, buffer. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's a very interesting way, and I love the musical metaphor too of the baseline of under uh, underlying uh, practices that allow that trouble to 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 shine. Uh, all right, it's eight o'clock, and I want to thank my my special guest uh, tonight, Ian Lecure and uh, David Cooper Moore. Uh, thank you for reflecting as first year teachers, and thank those of you who joined us. Um, for the Hangout, Kathy Leo Grand, Elizabeth Tefrasum, Ed Crane, Sarah Ben, and Zoe Wang, th and Natasha, I saw you there. And for all of you who are just listening in on the YouTube, we're glad you're joining us here as well. Now, I do want to invite you to stay tuned for the next Media Smart webinar. Just two weeks from now, our special uh, visiting scholar from Brazil is going to be joining us for a conversation about media literacy in the context of physical education. So I think that date is scheduled for Tuesday, January 19th. Maybe you'll be able to join us. I hope so. In any case, I'm Renee Hobbs, Media Education Lab, Harrington School of Communication, University of Rhode Island. Thanks for joining us tonight for this webinar. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.